I wasn't a monk for long, um, but when I left Rhodes in Sri Lanka, uh, a couple weeks after I left Rhodes, the abbot of my temple came to try to convince me to take Rhodes again. And I said, well, I think that yeah, I really want to have a family, um, children, and he put his finger in my cup of tea that I'd given him, and he stirred his tea with his finger, and he said, James, this is all sex is. Stirred it with his finger. And I didn't feel that way at the time. I was um, 22, and uh, eventually had a family, I had a career. But one of the questions that it led to for me at the time was, what if I had been able to just take a pill at the time to suppress my desire for sex, uh, and put all of that energy into some other pursuits, into um, writing my dissertation, or into being a good monk. And that's kind of the question that has led to this particular investigation. I run a think tank called the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies. And um, in the Buddhist tradition, there is a long tradition of diagnosing personality, diagnosing the kind of karmic conditions that we bring to spiritual progress, and the particular obstacles that we have as a consequence of those karmic conditions, uh, whether we're particularly burdened by greed or lust or stupidity. Um, and the kinds and a diagnosis leads them to a prescription for particular kinds of meditations that help with the different kinds of obstacles. So, for instance, the prescription that if you are uh, consumed with greed, you should do charnel ground meditation to uh, reflect on the different stages of the decomposition of the body. Or if you're consumed with lust, you should think about the different components of uh, the opposite sex of the body, the different things that go into it and that will break down your lust. Um, and these are supposed to help with the particular obstacles. Um, the obstacles aren't just a matter of personality, they're also a matter of situation. When you're in a particular kind of life circumstance, you can have different obstacles depending on the circumstance. And in the West, uh, Western philosophy and psychology, there's now this diagnosis of situationism, which is that even people with really strong moral personalities, if they're put in really bad situations, can end up doing bad things. And so part of the goal is not just to have a consistent personality, but to have a strong, deeply rooted personality and moral psychology. Now in the West, uh, in neurology, there is also a long recognition that what we understand as moral behavior or moral sentiments has a deep neurological rootedness. So there's a an aspect of our brain that if you have particular lesions in one part, you're going to have one kind of behavior, and another part, another kind of behavior. And this is one of the classic cases that led to that kind of recognition. Phineas Gage was a railway worker, and an explosion on the line drove a steel rod through his skull. Um, he survived, but his personality after the accident was described as fitful, irreverent, indulging at times in the grossest profanity, manifesting little deference for his fellows. His brain damage led to a change in his moral personality. And uh, this, I think, has led to uh, an increasing medicalization or a medical interpretation of moral personality in the West. Recently, in bioethics, uh, this is Julian Zabolescu at Oxford University, also an Australian, and John Harris at University of Manchester. Um, this, they have been debating for about 10 years now with many others uh, a, an aspect of bioethics called moral enhancement. The notion that we might be able to use pills or various kinds of drugs to enhance our moral personality. Um, now, Zabolescu has tended to emphasize the drug oxytocin and the, and the moral sentiment of empathy. Uh, both of these guys come out of what we call the utilitarian tradition, or the Western tradition of consequentialism, 
attempting to think about things in terms of their consequences. And so they haven't given deep thought to the idea of the virtues or moral personality. John Harris uh, emphasizes instead intelligence. So for basically, in a very rough way, uh, Savalesco would say, give everybody uh, pills to make them nicer, and the world would be a better place. And Harris says, give everybody pills to make them smarter, and the world would be a better place. And they argue back and forth. And uh, one of the things that their argument um, illustrates is how weak the contemporary debate is in understanding 2,000, 2,500 years of moral psychology that's been worked out from Aristotle in the West to the present, and from Buddhist and Hindu and Confucian traditions to the present, that there have always been virtue ethicists, wisdom traditions, who have acknowledged that you can be too compassionate, that it's possible to be too courageous, or it's possible to be too dispassionate, too intelligent that there are golden means, and that everything has to be balanced against each other, that you can't just increase one virtue without increasing all the virtues as part of a moral personality development, as part of a, a cultivation of the virtues. In the Buddhist tradition, we talk about virtues in terms of the paramis, or the paramitas, the, the excellences of character. And so part of the intervention that I've been trying to make through the Cyborg Buddha Project is to talk about uh, a broader understanding of the virtues informed by Buddhism and the other Western traditions that allow us to talk about um, the interdependence of these things. Now, one of the things that's nice about Buddhism in this particular debate is that under, unlike the Christian tradition or the Abrahamic traditions, the uh, Hindu Buddhist tradition uh, is relatively open to the idea of technological enhancement as a part of spiritual progress. The Abrahamic tradition basically assumes that human beings were created as is 6,000 years ago, and that they have a date with God at some point in the future, and that when they meet God in the future, they're pretty much supposed to be the same as when we, they were created. In the Hindu Buddhist tradition, the universe is billions, trillions of years old, and human beings and animals and gods go through cycles of change and human beings can become, like the Buddha, superhuman, and have superhuman capacities. In fact, that's part of the goal, is to expand the capacities of the human being. So there's an, an embrace of what we now call post-humanity, or a transhuman possibility, in the Buddhist and Hindu traditions that you don't see, and probably in the Confucian and Taoist traditions as well, that you don't see in the Abrahamic traditions. But there's also a complementary, complementarity of Buddhism to how the Western traditions think about these things. One aspect of that is that Buddhism's essential critique is that there is no self, right? That there is no soul. Its critique is that there is no essential personality that has to be defended. A lot of this debate about improving moral personality gets caught on the question of, well, if I change that about myself, will I still be me? The Buddhist says, who is you? There is no you. You don't exist. So what's important is that you learn the skillful way, the skillful path that will lead you to liberation. Let go of the you. Become the different person that, needs, that you need to be. Buddhism also underlines the importance of the multiple virtues, as I said, especially the, the complementarity of wisdom and compassion. And Buddhism, uh, at least implicitly, Buddhist uh, ethics has a social dimension. It's not just about changing individuals so that individuals become better people. It's also about creating a, a Dharma Raj uh, society, a, a society in which there's righteous rule, in which the Sangha provides counsel for the improvement of society as a whole so that there's less greed, hatred, and ignorance in society as a whole. And that's part of that situation that's problem, is that just being good individuals in a terrible society doesn't work. We have to also create a better society in order to be truly good. When people say to me, how can you argue for these human enhancement technologies when you're a Buddhist? Shouldn't you just be arguing that people should meditate and improve themselves alone? I say that Buddhism is like this famous Christian prayer, the serenity prayer. Grant me the serenity 
to accept the things I can't change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Increasingly, we are able to understand the brain and the body in ways that allow us to change things that we previously couldn't change or not change easily, that it may have taken extraordinary effort to change. Now, I'm going to talk about some of these technologies, but I also want to caution that we have to avoid the fix-it mentality. We have to avoid the notion that um, just because you can take a pill to be more wakeful, that you shouldn't get enough sleep. Or just because you can take a pill to be more compassionate, you shouldn't try to be more compassionate without the pill. Um, that's a very important. Um, also, this idea of an extended moral so, um, social ethics as a part of Buddhism, there's now a, uh, an extensive literature on the way that Buddhism has been co-opted in different societies at different times by militarism, by patriarchy, uh, by other forms of power. Zen and its role in Japanese fascism is a good example. A lot of Westerners, naive about Buddhism, don't understand this history and think that uh, Buddhism is always going to be a peaceful religion. It's always going to be counseling uh, the good things. But in fact, Buddhism has a history of being co-opted by these power structures. And so we need to emphasize within Buddhism as well the social dimension of these ethics. The wheel of the Dharma has to be turned at the societal level and not just the individual level. But that said, this is kind of the, the model that I've been working with about uh, the relationship between different kinds of virtues and uh, a model that hopefully uh, corresponds roughly to many of the different wisdom traditions around the world, a model that is partly based on some of the positive psychology. Positivity, which is basically different in terms of understandings of happiness or different aspects of happiness, caring, different aspects of compassion, intelligence, and self-control. And I've put in some of the Buddhist terms for these different kinds of things. And of course, Buddhism is very sophisticated on analyzing the different kinds of compassion, love and kindness, uh, sympathetic joy, and so forth, and the importance of upekka in balancing uh, love and kindness. But it's also very sophisticated in understanding the different aspects of intelligence, the way that intelligence can be uh, developed and is an important part of moral personality. Uh, many people pause when they think about, well, is happiness really itself a virtue, or is it the result of virtue? Is, is it something, a reward for being good that you become happy? But a lot of the research shows that happiness itself, people who are ordinarily happy, um, are find it easier to be good. Five minutes? Five minutes more? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so part of what I'm going to briefly uh, outline for you is that this virtue ethics model uh, can correspond to the neurology partly through the dialogue of personality. And these are some of the personality characteristics which have been shown to be inheritable and persistent in people over time and somewhat predictive of their behavior. So briefly, um, okay, uh, so mindfulness and self-control. Um, we increasingly understand the role of different parts of the brain, executive function, uh, metacognition, in abil people's ability to exercise restraint, the personality trait of conscientiousness uh, uh, is predictive of some of these things over time. And we have pathologies which relate to a lack of self-control, attention deficit disorder, various kinds of addictions. And so we have the diagnostic negative aspect, but also the capacity to be more, to have more self-control than we ordinarily would have. Um, and, and I will say this about all of the virtues, exercise, sleep, and diet are an important bedrock for the exercise of almost all the virtues, uh, but especially for self-control. We know that people um, have less self-control when they're sleep-deprived, uh, when they have, uh, don't exercise enough, and so forth. Mindfulness meditation, there's now an extensive literature on the way that mindfulness meditation can increase various aspects of self-control. And we're beginning to have technologies which can facilitate the uh, development, the cultivation of self-control. Wearables, this wearable on my wrist, the Fitbit, is an aspect of a kind of wearable self-control that reminds me when I should do more walking or when I should do more exercise. 
But we're also beginning to develop specific treatments for weaknesses of self-control um, for people who are sex offenders in prisons. Testosterone <laughs> suppression can be helpful to uh, keep them from being reoffenders. Alcohol aversion drugs. Uh, drugs for overcoming addiction to opiates, uh, even vaccines that people can be given so that they, even if they take the drugs, they don't feel high from the drugs. And eventually, neurogenesis, the ability to grow new uh, brain cells, new neural stem cells that allow the brain to overcome old patterns of behavior, old stuck habitual patterns. In terms of caring, we're increasingly understanding that there are two kinds of caring. Uh, there's the caring of feeling a gut sympathy with someone, being able to see that they've stepped on a nail and feel that nail in our own foot. And some people, uh, for instance, uh, psychopaths, have less of that. And then there's the uh, understanding at an intellectual level what somebody else's life is like, so that even if you don't see that they're in pain, you understand from their circumstance that they're in pain. And that's a kind of cognitive empathy. It takes a certain kind of social intelligence to be able to exercise that empathy. And that empathy can also be increased. And people, for instance, with autism or Asperger's syndrome have uh, difficulties with that. But we have in an incredible amount of research now in this area. So for instance, uh, Prozac and other serotonin reuptake inhibitors uh, they increase your sensitivity to seeing other people's pain. That may or may not be good morally, but we can come back to that. Um, testosterone appears to increase aggression. There's some um, literature, but they use the other way. So there's also certain kinds of mind training. It turns out that reading romance novels helps people learn about other people's emotions and makes them more sympathetic. Um, as opposed to, for instance, uh, bad virtual reality or bad video games, which might reduce that. Loving kindness meditation appears to increase empathy. But we're also beginning to do some research with giving people oxytocin, giving people serotonin, giving people less uh, testosterone suppression in order to modulate some of this. And again, the relationship to certain kinds of genes that we may in the future be able to modulate as well. Now, intelligence, uh, Western Buddhism, Anglo Buddhism, white Buddhism uh, in the United States, it tends to be kind of anti intellectual. It tends to be very focused on concentration, practice, and meditation, and has given less emphasis to the parts of the Eightfold Path, the intellectual parts of the Eightfold Path, that require the refinement of intelligence. Also, less attention to Shiva, to the importance of uh, discipline, self discipline. Um, but clearly, the it is important. There are differences between people and their capacity for different intellectual uh, abilities. And we're increasingly able to enhance, at least temporarily, some of these intellectual abilities with drugs and other devices. So again, uh, we're less intelligent when we haven't exercised, when we're sleep deprived, when we eat a poor diet. Uh, mindfulness meditation appears to increase certain kinds of cognitive uh, faculties and kinds of aspects of memory and so forth. But also, our ability to have an, an electronic brain, uh, to have all of our memory encoded in devices, in our phones, and in our computers, this is, in a, in a sense, an expansion of our intelligence, which is uh, a modern version of intelligence enhancement. We're going to be able to soon begin to delay the aging process. We know that aging is one of the things that uh, dulls our intelligence over time, our various kinds of intelligence. And we're going to be able to slow that, perhaps even reverse it. And we're also developing the brain machines that you heard about this morning. Uh, transcranial direct current stimulation, transcranial magnetic stimulation. Eventually being able to put small robots in the brain, which will allow us to connect directly to computers and have some kinds of intelligence enhancement that way. And more direct control over our moral personality and our emotions. Fairness, uh, just briefly, a lot of the fairness story for me boils down to an argument between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. The amygdala is the part, the monkey brain part of the back of our brain, um, and this model of uh, John Haidt's I find particularly useful. John Haidt has done research on what are the moral sentiments that we carry around as monkeys. Uh, don't push other monkeys out of the tree, share the bananas fairly, 
Uh, when you see who the dominant male is in the hierarchy, bend your knee to that monkey. Um, uh, don't throw poo, because uh, poo is dirty, and so forth. And part of the argument uh, about becoming a fair person is when you feel these sentiments popping up from your amygdala, from the back lizard parts of your brain, does the front part of your brain have the capacity to tell them to shut up? The bigger and more well-connected our prefrontal cortex is, the weaker and less uh, well-dominant uh, are the back parts of our brain are, the fairer, the more uh, capacity we have to exercise discrimination between different kinds of moral sentiments, to say to some, shut up, and to others, yes, you're correct. Um, this particular model shows that conservatives, or people who call themselves conservatives, tend to respond to all the moral sentiments. They don't tell them to shut up. And liberals are able to tell some to shut up and not others. In terms of happiness, as we've heard, happiness has a variety of different meanings. And the Western uh, psychological research on happiness is be just beginning to become sophisticated enough to discriminate. You heard in Jeffrey's talk, he was talking about the amount of time that you spend happy versus overall evaluation of your happiness. That's part of it, is that mood in itself, you know, you can imagine that uh, Mother Teresa in Calcutta, she may have spent her whole life feeling like she was doing something good with her life, feeling like she was meaningful, and she may never have been happy. She may never have been really delighted with the day. Um, that's one end of the extreme. The other end of the extreme is always doing exactly what you want, always feeling a certain amount of pleasure with what you're doing, and at the end you think, what did I do? Was it worth it? Did I live a meaningful life? These are two very different kinds of happiness. Both have neurological roots. For, in general, happiness is, turns out to be about 50% genetically determined. That you, if you suffer a terrible accident, you're going to be sad for a while, but eventually you come back to where you were before. If you win the lottery, you're going to be happy for a while, come back to where you were before. Life circumstances determine some of our happiness, but we also have this deep genetic and neurological component. And so these pathologies of depression and mania, we're beginning to understand how they come about. And we also understand the difference between what leads to persistent, flourishing well-being versus just happiness. Persist for instance, the genes that lead to conscientiousness or self-control are more related to having a lifetime of well-being, of, of meaning and well-being, as opposed to happiness. So there are two very different kinds of practices that can lead to one versus the other. And I think both are important. We don't want to live a life of no happiness, of no day-to-day uh, -day positive mood, uh, and just have meaning. And we don't want to live a life with, without any meaning either. So marriage, for instance, and having children leads to a life of meaning. But having children actually makes you miserable. <laughs> and that's why, uh, to, you know, when people are given a choice in, in uh, most societies, and, and I understand in China as well, as well, they're having fewer and fewer children because it's not a very rational thing to do to sacrifice your life for this puking mess of, of, of flesh. Um, except that at the end of your life, once you've done it, you feel a certain sense of accomplishment and maybe they're there to help take care of you. Um, so there's trade-offs between these different kinds of happiness. Um, antidepressants can lead to more positive mood, but uh, for instance, we're beginning to understand what are the genes that lead people to be able to bounce back from negative circumstances and how to enhance those. And finally, um, part of my model, and this is probably the weakest aspect of it, but I think Jeffrey's model is beginning to point to some of the complexities within, uh, is this capacity for transcendence, the capacity to step outside of the ordinary understanding of reality, the ordinary boundaries of the self, and to have a more transcendent perspective on life. And again, the personality uh, characteristic that seems to be related to this is openness to experience. People who have higher openness tend to be more likely to be able to be hypnotized, for instance. They tend to be more spiritual versus religious. Um, and the neurology, there are certain uh, genes that are associated with mystical experiences and peak experiences and so forth. People coming into his training program uh, had predispositions to be able to already have these mystical experiences or not, and those who had those predispositions were more likely to experience them. 
In terms of transcendent technology, we've heard about some of them already. Uh, there's an enormous amount of psychedelics research. This is a, a mapping of the connectivity of the brain before you take uh, psilocybin, one of the psychedelics, and the, and the connections between different parts of the brain after you have taken the psychedelic. Um, and part of what psychedelics do, as well as certain kinds of trance experiences or meditative experiences, is that they break down the default mode network in the brain, the part of the self in the part of the brain, the brain that's constantly telling you that you are a particular person in a particular place, um, and that, uh, that you exist. Um, and we're also able to do this with transcranial magnetic stimulation, for instance. There's a part of the brain that maintains the boundaries of the body, and with certain kinds of meditative experiences, you can feel that uh, uh, suddenly disappear and feel one with everything. But we can also zap that part of the brain with magnets, and people can experience that temporarily. And, and not we don't want to do that for a long time, but it can be a temporary experience. So that is the conclusion. But the, the concluding thought here is that um, I think Buddhism has a challenge. Uh, many Buddhists probably uh, react to these kinds of technologies, saying the old ways are the best ways, they're the less dangerous ways, we should stick with those ways. Um, we have to be open to the possibility that we may be able to carefully, uh, with a lot of uh, foresight, examine the different kinds of personalities, the different kinds of obstacles that people face, and the different uh, possibilities that we all have to democratize, to make accessible to everyone the experiences and capacities for moral behavior that only great saints and sages in the past would have had been able to experience because of our different conditions. Um, and that, I think, is an optimistic view that we may be able to have a truly post-human idea of what the spiritual path might be in the future. Thank you.